What's up, everybody? Jason here with Worst Favorite Record, and today I am joined by a very special guest, Michael Flynn, a solo artist and member of the band Slow Runner, one of my favorite songwriters. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So we're here um, to talk about a record. That's what we do here on this podcast. We talk to guests about quote unquote bad records that they enjoy anyways. Uh, before we get to the record that you came to talk about, I was hoping we could dig in a little bit to your own music. First, Firstly, I just want the people listening to be aware of it because I think it's great. But secondly, I think it also provides some context maybe for why you chose the record you did and, and kind of how you feel about that record. Slow Runner was a band you were in. Yes. Uh, you were the primary songwriter. Um, Josh Kaler was your, I think, you know, main collaborator in that project, although there were other yeah. people kind of floating in and out, perhaps. Yep. Yeah. Um, can you talk about what Slow Runner was exactly and what it is now, if it is at all anymore? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> we were, um, so yeah, I met Josh Kaler in college. Um, we moved uh, to Charleston, South Carolina after that. And um, um, because I had gone undergrad there and I knew places we could play. And um, so we started playing around town. And at that time we were playing as Michael Flynn because I had been in a band or two. And then when the band dissolves, you lose all your momentum and you have to start over from scratch. And I was like, oh, I'll just use my name so that uh, I don't have to worry about that problem anymore. Long story short, wrote a bunch of songs made a record uh, in our house in uh, West Ashley and uh, and uh, ended up signing with Sony BMG who re-released that record, which was called No Disassemble. And um, we just thought musically that it made more sense to call it a, a name, whether that was like making it a band or just more like tallest man on earth kind of uh alias type thing that would make uh at the, at, especially at that time you know john mayer had burst onto the scene and so name name dudes had a certain uh uh expect musical expectations and i have always wanted to be more sonically adventurous than that so we changed it to slow runner and um many adventures ensued toured all over um, had, you know, a few publishing deals that helped get songs on TV shows and, uh, commercials and stuff like that. And, um, then, um, Josh Kaler moved to Nashville. And so we kind of put the band identity on hiatus. We still collaborate on everything. I mean, I have a new record, um, that, uh is we're waiting on mastering now and he's on that one he's been on everything i've released either slow runner michael flynn whatever just um not as intensely of a collaboration on the on the stuff that i put out under my name but slow runner is still a thing and in fact i think this new record um i'm probably going to just go back to being slow runner since uh you know uh, long ago, I thought Michael Flynn was a decent sounding name, but it has since been dragged through the mud and uh, my brand is in shambles thanks to uh, current uh, geopolitical events that have rendered me ungoogleable. So in the meantime, there's this other thing that I also built that's sitting there uh, unused that also, you know, I don't feel like the records I've put out under my name are any less adventurous or you could even pick a song from that and a song from a slow runner record and it probably sound like the same stuff. So yeah, I'm going to pull slow runner out of my back pocket and start uh, putting that on my business cards again here in 2023. That's funny. Um, it's also funny that you mentioned the implications of a songwriter using their full name because on the, on the normal YouTube channel, taste like music, there's three of us. And my friend Kramzer always gives me a hard time about how much, like if we do our top five records of the year or something, I always have a singer songwriter in there. And he always says, oh, surprise, surprise, it's a person. And it's like, yeah, people have names. Like, that's not that weird. 
but there is that kind of implication of what that music is just because they're using their name. So that that's funny that you uh, bring that up. On this uh, podcast, I, I <clears throat> typically start by going through this little bit of a spiel about what type of record you've chosen, whether it's a record that you truly deeply love and don't understand why the rest of the world doesn't, or if it's something that you kind of get an ironic enjoyment from, or maybe it's, you know, the the worst record in a beloved discography. I don't, I'm not entirely sure this record applies to any of the categories. Um, this is kind of a, a different selection. And in fact, it might be regarded as one of the most important records in its genre. <laughs> it's um, true. I kind of ch totally cheated on this uh, assignment. But, but it still uh, somehow totally makes sense for, for this show to talk about. Well, my angle, the angle I was going for is a uh, record that would make very little sense if you were to just guess what record I was going to pick. You would never necessarily guess. And there's also like the mildly, it's sort of the musical equivalent of a grown man hanging out, um, leaning on the fence by the playground where all the kids are at. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, it's fine. <laughs> so I'm sure people already know from the thumbnail and the video title and stuff like that, what you've chosen, but the big reveal uh, today we were talking about singable songs for the very young by Rafi, who I was surprised how old this record was. This came out in 76. Yeah. I was definitely aware of Rafi. I was born in 84. Okay. So he had lingering impact through the 80s and I think even into the 90s somewhat. Yeah. Um, if you don't know, Rafi is kind of the 70s version of like the Wiggles would be now or some, someone like that. Children's he he started out as a folk artist and wanted to be a, a famous folk singer and then kind of fell into this performing for children thing and, and became very successful at it. So this record, this is an interesting pick. I like, I'm wondering, you do have kids. Does that, is that a huge part of why you chose this? Or is this something that has just been with you since your childhood? Well, I, I have, unfortunately for the audio listeners, I do have the visual so this is my copy of this record, which um, I don't remember when we got it. I was born in 77. So I grew, grew up always having it, just would listen to it over and over as a, as a, as a kid. And, um, and then, yeah, not my daughter, who's 10 now, but, you know, when she was, you know, let's say three through six, even, we were... We would listen to this thing nonstop uh, on the same record player that I grew. You know, I basically inherited my dad's record player and the the thirty or so records that my parents had, which are mostly things that I had from childhood. And I nearly chose. I, I, I would have chosen it, but you would have had to find a, a copy of it because you can't stream it. There's a Chipmunks record where they cover like Beat It and Uptown Girl and all the you know. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, that was important to my musical development as well, of course. I mean, everybody's influenced by the chipmunks one time or another. But um, so we, uh, yeah, I ended up, when, once I had a kid um, and I wanted her to get turned on by music and the record was right there. And so sure enough, it just confirmed for me the universal appeal of it that she latched on and you know certain songs would provoke intense giggling and or just hyperactive running around we had this thing we would run around the couch and run into each other and then run the opposite way and, you know elaborate little games of just listening to this record in our basement so there's obviously a, a sentimental factor you have these memories with with your daughter yeah but, but when when you're listening to it with her are you also thinking you know what this is actually pretty musically interesting even to my adult ears or is it simply just like this is good kids music no no so i left that yeah i it is musically fascinating to me on multiple levels but um in high school i had you know my my dad had the stereo set up where i could uh, make tape i could i could transfer tapes to cassette and so for some reason uh, i got you know there, there was this uh, late 70s folk children's music 
boomlet that I had several records from, a couple of Raffi ones, a Roger Whitaker record. Anyways, I put them all on cassette. And at the same time, I was discovering what then, you know, in the 90s was like contemporary folk music and songwriting uh, through that angle and sort of learning what makes lyrics good and um, arranging and all these uh, things. And so there was this like connection where uh, these, you know, a lot of these songs were uh, as emotionally resonant to teenage me as they were to five-year-old me and as they are to grown ass me. That's interesting. I would, I listened to this record this morning, start to finish. Yeah. And um, there is like a real directness in, in all of it. It's the longest song is must be Santa, which is two minutes and 22 seconds, which is like their, the, the Prague epic of this record. <laughs> uh, yes. Most of the songs are around a minute long. Yeah. Um, and it's just a simplicity of ideas and extremely catchy, immediate melodies. Yeah. And I can remember, I don't think I owned this record as a kid. I just heard the songs somewhere growing up, but I was amazed at how many of them just like, as soon as they started, I remembered the words to the entire song, having not heard them in maybe 35 years or so. So there's there's something about how direct they are that just sticks with you. And it's probably because my brain was developing at the time too, that they've kind of stayed with me. Right, but that is they're... true. They are very simple and yeah, direct and easily accessible. <clears throat> there, yeah, there's, there's no fat, there's nothing extra right. on the song. And... It, it basically like the first line of the song usually like sets up the premise. This is what we're singing about. We do that for a minute and then it's over. I was wondering in your own songwriting, if that is something you consider, like how simple can we make it? Because I think there's in your melodies, at least, I think there's a degree of, I don't want to call your melody simple, but I think hopefully you understand what I'm getting at that. I do. Yeah. There's an immediacy to them. Right. You, yeah, I so like many music nerds, I start out uh, unable to control the impulse to add and build and put a counter melody underneath that melody and make the, you know, basically make it as foolishly complicated as uh, humanly possible. And then before, so I'm in a constant uh, state where my instincts are pushing me in that direction. And then um, my analytical brain is like, what can, what is unnecessary? What can I cut? How do I strip this down to where there is zero? Uh, the old producer I worked with in the early days called it shoe leather. He's like, you gotta cut out all the shoe leather. I don't even know what that means. Uh, but yeah, anything, that's why so many, you know, there's a, a lot of my songs, there's no intro, you know, it just like, the vocal starts right at the top or um or the song ends with no outro or just um because a lot of it times they had intros and outros and i had to admit to myself how unnecessary they were and to pare down um the abundance of ideas to just the what is hopefully essential and yeah, I think folk music in general does that. And these songs are almost like a case study in how folk music does that. I, I agree completely. So in in uh, regard to the shortness of these tracks, I think you might assume that it is because kids have short attention spans that the songs should be made short. And I was thinking about this today when listening to it. I can't imagine a kid listening to this, being engaged with the song and it ending, but them like checking their watch or something like, is this over yet? Like anytime I've ever seen a kid listening to music, they've been fully in engaged, singing along. And when it ends, they immediately want it again. Do you, do you think that a lot of kids' music is dumbed down? Mm -hmm. And like, how, how much other kids music did you listen to with your daughter? Were you listening to the the contemporary? Were you listening to the Wiggles? And, and why is it maybe that this is a cut above a lot of children's music that we've seen since? 
Right. So I do think, I don't know how dumbed down it is as much as it is um, emotionally shallow. And that to me is the key difference with this music is that it's actually like emotionally complex, like it's playful. And there's there's at least one instrument on each song that's not on the other songs or, you know, like, oh, he plays a kazoo on this one. Oh, he scats on this one. On this one, there's sleigh bells. They just added cool little um, production touches that are really thoughtful, but it all kind of, there's a sort of, because they're working with rudimentary, you know, uh, uh, instrumentation, there's, you know, nothing fancy, nothing electronic. It sort of um, almost gives it like a somber, uh, undercurrent like some of the and his voice to me his voice is sweet but kind of sad like that must be santa song there's like a yearning in it that i don't know like it like it cuts me a little bit you know uh and it all and that's that it's it's always been that way and 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 uh the breadth of style i mean it's all folk music but you've got like You've got like hyperactive, you got silly things like uh, down by the bay, right? Where it's just like every every um, refrain is a punchline. And so as your kid, you're just, you're already laughing. By the time he gets to the third one, you're laughing before he even says the punchline and it's just this uproarious thing. But then like, uh, I wonder if I'm growing, is this beautiful uh, ballad, uh, this finger picked kind of ballad about, not being tall enough to reach the water fountain and sort of the inner monologue of a, an insecure child. And I'm sorry, the wiggles aren't hitting those notes for me. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, and I feel like because he came from this um, folk singer tradition, he had that stuff in his DNA that, um, is is maybe it's of that era or just that he you know wanted to be cat stevens or whatever and so it's he it, everything is imbued with that sort of uh depth of emotion that is like not even on the radar of most kids music that uh, most other kids music that i've heard not to mention that it's just unpalatable um production wise and arranging wise the more different, you know, wiggles and more, more modern stuff where um, I can't make it 30 seconds before I want to jump out the car window uh, without even breaking. And with this, it's it's all sounds that I love on, you know, Van Morrison records and other, uh, you know, it's, it's all stuff that uh, also has other musical uh, meanings to me. So it's endlessly listenable it doesn't get annoying even when it's occasionally silly yeah there's a couple songs that i made specific note of uh like robin in the rain mm -hmm. which feels like it could almost be like a mccartney kind of grant one of his granny tunes absolutely uh, it's got these really jazzy chords it might be a ukulele i'm not sure the chords aren't actually that complex uh, i looked them up some sevens in there but it, it feels very for a kid's song it feels um pretty elaborate the the chord yeah. progression and then cool on horns yeah there's horns on the nice horn horn arrangement on it and then on uh, willoughby wallaby you got that kind of like billy preston-esque electric piano all over it which is really right cool. uh, which i like da, 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 da. Just, you know it's it it constantly feels like they're having fun and goofing off and uh it never feels too heavy or overwrought it's, it feels like these were all gut impulses making other creative decisions. And one of the things that I think is not a coincidence as far as why it was produced in this way that has aged so well is that if you look in the credits, and I've got the record right here and I can look at them, um, it was, um, um, well, obviously Ken, Raffi and Ken Wiley are the co-producers, but a young Dan Lanois, I saw that this record. Yeah, I, and played Mando was, on one song. 
Uh, yeah, he played. I, I, well, I think he was just hanging out the whole time. Basically, you know, as I understand it, and there's a Rafi podcast that uh, if anyone wants to do a deep dive that has a whole episode dedicated to just making this record, and it's fascinating. And it, they were all in the basement of, a, I think, a brownstone in uh, Toronto. And, and uh, yeah, Daniel Lanois, who went on to shape so much important music uh, in the latter 20th century, uh, was cutting his teeth on the Raffi record. And I think similar it's 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 you know, I don't I don't know for sure what what creative choices did he weigh in on, but the sophisticated tastefulness of the arrangements and everything, uh, when I saw his name, I was like, what? Mind blown. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And yet it kind of does make sense. Yeah, my mind was blown too. And it because he was listed as Dan Lanois, I was like, is this a different person? But the right. uh, the wikipedia link link to him so i was like i guess yeah. i guess it's really him so i was just wondering where maybe you think the line is between children's music and like i guess we can call it real music uh mm -hmm. adult music um because there's certainly a, a number of other artists who have made children's records um they might be giants springs to mind. Um, you've got the point by Harry Nilsson and Johnny Cash made a children's record. Kenny Loggins, Linda Ronstadt has a, a, a lullaby record. And what is really the difference, I guess, is what I'm saying. Between this asking. one and. Well, no, not between this those and those, ones? but, but oh, where, oh. where do okay. you shift into like, where does it become not children's music? Right. I think you go further and further in that direction. And there's certainly um, records that maybe aren't considered children's records that are very silly or, or goofy. And, and maybe it's just the subject matter. And maybe that's the only thing. I mean, it's, that, it's a very, very good question. I think, uh, you know, my initial instinct was like, oh, this music's all comforting. But it's really actually, you know, I don't remember if it's on this one or the next one. Oh, Five Little Pumpkins is on this one. You know, that's a, that's a Halloween thing. It's just, kids do like spooky stories and stuff like that. So um, I think, um, well, the absence of romance as a lyrical topic is probably the correct answer. I, I think harmonic simplicity is intrinsic to children's music. That if it gets, you know, if the chords aren't, uh, it is not clear what the emotion is. Like I think if it's clearly a spooky song or it's clearly a goofy song or it's clearly a I'm growing up ballad so that kids can identify how that what what the music is making them feel and it's not confusing what it's making them feel. It all makes sense emotionally. Whereas, you know, play a kid both sides now and just going to go over their head. They don't know. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to focus on, they're not going to get it. Um, so I think that's probably somewhere around there is what it is. I mean, a lot of those were just sort of, um, it seems like it was, it was sort of what is now, oh, he's making a country record used to be, oh, he's making a children's record. It was sort of the, all right, I've exhausted my commercial appeal with grownups. I'll make you know, songs from Pooh Corner or whatever, and right. boom, new market is opened up and I can finally uh, pay off the mortgage on my McMansion. So I was wondering in your own songwriting, if you ever use your daughter as a barometer for the catchiness or the memorability of your writing, do you ever run anything by her and, or, or maybe not tell her to listen to it, but if, if you notice her humming something or singing something, that set does that set off a light bulb like hey that's a good idea that that one sticks sometimes i mean i generally it's tricky like when she was little you know i did all my writing uh at night in the basement with headphones on just whispering into a microphone sort of you know um and i've always kind of kept it separate from her not hiding it from her but just i don't know like the emotional headspace of being a parent to me when I'm I'm trying to write music or create something I need to feel like I'm 
I'm an adventurer. I'm spelunking. I'm go I'm going to mysterious, dangerous places. Uh and uh and and, and I'm you know risking everything to uh try to leap to the uh handhold of the crag that I'm climbing during the thunderstorm. I don't know. Like I have it has to feel a little dangerous. I have to be able to um let let a few f bombs rip or whatever, and just feel the opposite of how I feel when I'm uh, when I'm in full on dad mode. So a lot of it, and a lot of it, I don't you know. Uh, sometimes there are songs that I just as soon as she not here because of stuff like that. Right. Um, but uh, certainly, um, you know, doing it all at a home studio, and my wife works from home, and she, uh, you know, if she's complaining to me by the end of the day that the song that she can't stop but hearing the song that I was working on that day I usually take that as a good sign but a, but also a cautionary tale to maybe <laughs> make sure it's not just pure annoying <laughs> right and my daughter has her own taste at this point she's into like crazy Japanese this hyperactive uh, the hyper pop thing yeah, man, she's, uh, and I don't, and it, so we're, we're, you know, I really enjoyed the years when I could totally curate what she was into. And I was like, here's this is band churches and the girl has a high pitched voice. I know you're going to dig, oh, you know, and I could like, uh, decide all those things. And at this point she has broken off into her own adventure. So I don't, I, I think we are, we are entering the phase of dad's music being, uh, totally, uncool and embarrassing so one last thing about this raffi record for me listening to it there is one thing about it that to me would hurt its replayability and that is the children singing right i'm down with with the songs and the performances and i understand why they're there they're there to encourage um engagement from their audience but to me, it hurts how much that I, as an adult, would be able to put it on and, and listen to it over and over again. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that and, and what you think about it. Does it bother you at all or, or not? I mean, I've always kind of dug that kind of thing. I mean, I, I not not to say that I you know, probably would like it better if there was a little less of it. You know, like, uh, let's be honest, I usually pick the needle up and skip my dreidel. Um because it's all kids singing. It's just, it's, there's not even any instrument. There might be like a violin and then kids singing. And, but, but like the more we get together, I kind of like it when they come in. And I like it at this point. It's funny because I view it through, you know, I was just listening to a, um, a Sylvan Esso song yesterday where they sample the kids going, no. And uh, occasionally, you know, hipsters will deploy the kids singing uh, thing. So between that side of it and between just my own, you know, once you've been a parent, then you're just a big softy and these things work. These things just work on you. You hear the kids singing and uh, your heart swells up a little. So it's not, it doesn't terribly bother me. It also kind of reinforces what to me is very much like a, uh, the hippie aesthetic that he was kind of, that he had come up in and that he has really, you know, Rafi is sort of like a pretty accomplished envi environmentalist at this point and has sort of always uh, not been shy about his philosophy uh, regarding how humans should treat each other and stuff like that. So like the more we get together, you know, to me, that's like his mission statement. And and so it makes sense when the kids come in on that one. And it's like, I don't know, I, I get part of me. I, I do get that that can feel trite and uh, annoying. Let's be honest, those kids are a little pitchy, but. But it works on me and it makes me it's there's just this inherent optimism and to me it's a beautiful vulnerability of kids um singing poorly that uh uh the charm cancels out the annoyance for me anyway 
All right. Well, thank you for doing this again. Um, I think it was very interesting to think about kids' music on kind of a more intellectual level instead of just uh, kind of disregarding it for um, being simple and for kids. Right. If, if, if I may be so bold, please have me back sometime and I'll actually do the assignment and pick a truly bad album that I adore. <laughs> there were finalists that I, that I thought this was would be a more interesting conversation, but um, I'd, be, I'd love to come back on and talk about some really terrible music. I would love to have you back for that. Maybe after we uh, stop recording here, you can tell me what those other finalists were. We can All right. work on that. Um, I hope everyone listening goes and checks out Slow Runner and Michael Flynn's music. Truly one of my favorite songwriters. Um, I think you have a handful of songs, maybe a dozen that are like perfect songs that mm -hmm. I just listening to your music. Sometimes I feel like the emotion of the songs hit me. They do their job, but at the same time, I just go, man, that is just such perfectly written. Just, Damn, how how is that even possible? So no. um, I love your music. Uh, I, I really hope everyone hears it. Honestly, that's my main goal with this whole podcast is to shine light on on other people's music. So thanks again for being here. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah. And uh, make sure everyone listening, hope hope everyone uh, hits the like button, subscribes and does all that stuff to help the, the channel and the podcast out. Uh, but other than that, we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>